Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Replace Educational Webinar. Uh, so my name is Maud, and I'm working on the Replace project. So for those of you who don't know this project, um, the aim is to collect the expertise on alternative methods to animal testing in one central open access database. And um, the aim of the Replace Educational Webinar series is uh, to put the, the expertise of the database in the spotlight. So today we will have a, a presentation on evaluating uh, the toxicity of um, sea dumped munitions on um, fish and human cells. Uh, but before we start, I would like to give you uh, practical information. So um, today we will have uh, only one speaker and the Q&A session, session will be at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions in the meantime, please put them in the chat and I will read them after all. Um, then this webinar is also recorded and will be placed uh, in the coming weeks on the YouTube channel of Replace, so it will be freely available. And uh, finally, an important information, this, this webinar is accredited by the Flemish and Brussels regions. So um, if you would like to receive a certificate of attendance, uh, please put your name and email address in the chat. So we will now start uh, with the presentation and I will introduce the speaker of today. Um, so Dr. Jao Barbosa holds uh, a bachelor degree in biology and a PhD in bioscience engineering. Uh, in his current position as a postdoctoral researcher at the Blue Gross lab, Research Lab at the Ghent University, he focuses on assessing environmental human and human health via the combination of in silico, in vitro and in vivo methods aiming at uh, advancing our understanding of the interactions between ecosystems and public health. And today, uh, Jao will present a work performed during his PhD um, thesis um, on the evaluation of the toxicity of sea dumped uh, conventional and chemical munitions to fish and human cells using a combination of cell variability assays. So, Jao, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, the introduction and for the chance to uh, present part of uh, of my work here today. I'll start by by sharing the the presentation and then we can go from from there. Um, let me just know if you are seeing my slides now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. OK, that's perfect. And yeah, and it's changing. So as as mentioned, uh, I'll be talking about uh, some work or part of the work I did during my my PhD. Uh, this PhD focused on the evaluation of uh, of the toxic potential of several munition related chemicals in in different marine organisms and also uh, human health. In this case, specifically, I'll be focusing on the work with fish cell lines and human cell lines in which we use a combination of uh, three cell viability assays to assess um, the cytotoxic potential acutely uh, of, uh, of these chemicals. Um, this, this protocol is described uh, and it was uploaded, as, as mentioned as well, in the Replace platform. And this is based on an OECD guideline that has been now available since June 2021. The guideline focuses on the on the fish cell line, so the RTGLW1, and I also here adapted it for the human cells uh, as well. But I'll give you some more details on the, the slide, slide changes that had to happen uh, in the following slides. So before that, a bit of a bit of background. As I'm sure all of you are aware, uh, the history of humankind has been marked by several armed conflicts going from the major historical ones, such as the First and the Second World War, up to more recent ones, uh, such as the one uh, now happening in Ukraine and actually in, in many other places as well, as we are currently going through uh, a time of quite some military uh, tension. Uh, specifically after the First and the Second World War, thousands of tons of munition were dumped all over the globe uh, and this included both conventional explosives and as well as uh, chemical warfare agents. Um, obviously the countries that were um, mainly involved in the conflicts are also those that have uh, that are more impacted by munition dump sites and one of these dump sites is um, is located over the Belgian coast. 
Um, so uh, it's referred to as the pardon mark, uh, and it's estimated that approximately 35,000 tons of munition, uh, mainly chemical munition, were dumped there after the, the First World War. So this is a, a problem, a, a worldwide problem, and there are current, currently some uh, guidelines when it comes to the management of, uh, of munition dump sites. And this tend to rely on the reporting of, uh, of known uh, uh, dumping locations on providing recommendations on how to act in case of encounter with dumped munition. And this is mainly relevant, as you can imagine, for, for fishermen. And on the monitoring of uh, concentrations of uh, munition related chemicals detected in the environment, being either in the sediment, in the water or in the marine biota uh, as well. And while this, of course, is extremely valuable, uh, it's also important to understand what kind of impact these chemicals may have in different marine organisms and uh, in humans uh, as well. And that's precisely the focus of, uh, of my PhD and the work I did. So within the PhD, I tried to cover uh, the effects or to explore the effects of uh, different chemicals um, to different uh, organisms and covering um, various uh, trophic levels within the food web. So we went from the producers to primary consumers to secondary consumers and tertiary and so on uh, with the fish cell lines. And also we hypothesized that the major route of exposure for, uh, for humans would be via the consumption of contaminated seafood. And based on that, based on this, on this assumption, we also picked two cell lines to evaluate. And that's uh, the, the focus of today's talk. So the assessment of the acute toxicity of these chemicals to both fish and human health. When it comes to the tested uh, chemicals, um, there are tens of chemicals uh, that may be detected in the environment, uh, munition related chemicals potentially detected in the environment. Here we picked seven different chemicals. So, three of them are uh, chemical warfare agents and related chemicals. More specifically, th these are three sulfur mustard related um, uh, products being theodiglycol, 1,4-dithian and 1,4-oxadian. And in addition to that, we also selected four explosives and related chemicals being TNT, tetril, 1,3-DNB and picric acid. These, of course, uh, were uh, selected based on relevance, not only to the pardon mark, but to many other dump sites um, as well. And so once the, the chemicals were selected, we could, uh, we could go for the, the work itself. Uh, and in this case, we specifically measured the, the toxic potential uh, of, uh, of these chemicals in three cell lines. As I mentioned, the assumption uh, when it comes to human consumption would be that, to human uh, exposure, uh, sorry, would be that this happens uh, mainly via the consumption of contaminated seafood. And so we picked two cell lines uh, that would be used as a proxy for two organs um, heavily involved in the digestive uh, system, being uh, the MG2 for uh, liver and the CACO2 for the, the intestinal epithelia. And, and of course, uh, for fish, we use the RTGL W1. Uh, as described in the OECD guideline number 249. Uh, for those not aware uh, about of, of this, uh, this OECD, um, this pretty much describes the, the in vitro to in vivo extrapolation of, uh, of acute toxicity of, of chemicals. So um, by testing uh, a given chemical with this cell line, we can extrapolate for the, the effects on the old fish uh, as well. So once we have these, chemi these, uh, these cell lines, we could uh, perform the work and uh, assess the effects on, on three um, different cellular compartments via three different uh, assays as well. So one of the assays, the neutral red, targeted the integrity of the lysosomal membrane. Uh, the LMR blue targeted the metabolic activity. And finally, the SFDA AM would target the integrity of the cell membrane uh, as well. So in practical terms, what, what happens, and here I, I, I'll be able to point out the differences between uh, cell lines. Uh, we start by, in a first step, by, by seeding uh, the cells in a 24 well plate. For the RTGL W1, we follow strictly the OECD guidelines. And so we seed uh, 350,000 cells per ml per well uh, as well. Um, and in this case, uh, with, with the fish cell lines, because this is a normal cell line, 
we are aiming at uh, having a fully confluent uh, well so that the, the cells are fully stable. Um, and this is uh, this this happens in opposition to what we look for in the CACO2 and the FG2. So being a normal cell line, uh, whenever RTGIL uh, um, gets to a fully confluent stage, um, there is no cell um, death at all because it's a, it's a normal cell line. Uh, for the CACO2 and FG2, being two cancer cell lines, um, whenever uh, in uh, in a confluent uh, scenario, they just keep growing, and eventually this will lead to potential cell uh, death that would interfere with our tests. So to avoid this, we found a number that would provide uh, solid readings when it comes to the fluorescence of the assays, but uh, not leading to overconfluence uh, that would potentially also lead to cell death interfering with our results. And so for the CACO2 and the FG2, uh, we started, we had, we had a starting concentration of uh, 120,000 cells per ml. Uh, so this, uh, this number also per each well. Um, after roughly 24 hours or at least 24 hours, we would evaluate visually if the cells would be fully attached to the wells. Uh, and uh, looking healthy. And if that was the case, we would then start with the exposure. Um, in the case of the RTGIL, this would last for 24 hours. Uh, for the CACO2 and the FG2, we decided to add an additional time point at 48 hours to evaluate if uh, this would lead to any differences in cytotoxicity uh, as well. And so after the exposure period, we would uh, then um, run a combination of the three assays. Uh, the LMR blue and the SFDA AM can be uh, read simultaneously because the, the wavelength at which these are, are read doesn't uh, conflict with each other. So we can have two very clear uh, numbers uh, there. The neutral red uh, has to happen independently um, of, of the other two, uh, but this, these tests are actually quite straightforward to, to follow as well and quite uh, quite uh, fast to, to perform too. So when it comes to the, the methodology, uh, this is pretty much it. And I'll, I'll now go into the, the results. Uh, I'll start with the fish and with the chemical warfare agents and related chemicals that we tested, um, or yeah, with, with the Artigil uh, cell line as a proxy for, for fish, uh, of course. You'll see on the left side uh, of the of the slide uh, a plot with uh, the concentration of the the chemical in this case one for dithian in milligrams per liter and in the y-axis you have the cell viability as a percentage. Of course, um, you expect that with an increase in concentration there would be a decrease in cell viability. In this case, uh, the intention was to be able to estimate an EC10 and an EC50. Uh, uh, however, as you can also see, uh, while there was an effect, uh, there was an effect uh, going um, over the the 10 percent mark. This didn't reach the the 50 percent. So for for these uh, for the three uh, chemical warfare agents and related chemicals, we could not estimate an EC50. So, in general, we saw that uh, these three chemicals did not severely uh, affected the, the cell lines um, or the, this cell line uh, within the tested concentration ranges. And in addition to that, it wouldn't really make much sense for us to test any higher because these concentrations are already uh, very, very high. So, knowing these, we also know uh, what kind of uh, toxicity threshold we can, we can expect. Um, in addition to this, um, we could still estimate an EC10 um, um, for the different chemicals, and this is important as it can be used as, as an indicative for uh, potential long-term long uh, effects. And we could also see um, that, in general, uh, the metabolic activity seems to be targeted first uh, when compared to the other two assays. So you can see here three different colors. Uh, the blue uh, indicates the results for the Alamar blue uh, for the metabolic activity. The red indicates the results for the neutral red for the cell um, for the lysosomal membrane, and and the green the SFDA AM for the cell uh, membrane. When it comes to the results for the explosives and related chemicals. 
still with the RTGL cell line, uh, we see that the toxicity uh, levels are, are much, much different now. Uh, you have this, a similar plot now for Tetril, one of the tested uh, explosives and related chemicals. And we could see that in general, the tested explosives tend to be much more toxic than the tested chemical warfare agents and related chemicals. We saw as well that Tetril is the most toxic of uh, all the tested uh, seven chemicals. And for this chemical specifically, uh, we could estimate both an EC10 and uh, an EC50. Uh, in this case, the EC10 was of 0 0.19 milligrams per liter, so rather low and an EC50 of 0 0.58 milligrams um, per liter as well. Overall, uh, when it comes to uh, to the, the the results for for the fish or the article uh, W1, uh, since we followed the, the OECD guideline test, test guideline number 249, um, we could use this data to have a, a, a complete one-on-one a -on -one extrapolation from in vitro to in vivo, and this means that the data that we get that we gather after 24 hours uh, of exposure with the uh, with the fish cells. Um, once this data le leads to an estimation of an EC50, this EC50 corresponds to the LC50 after 96 hours to the fish uh, themselves. Um, in addition to that, we, as I mentioned earlier, we estimated an EC10 and EC50 value for Tetril and also an EC10, va EC10 value for, for 1,3-DNB that are comparable to the concentrations detected in, in environmental samples. And of course, this is concerning, uh, but it should be also pointed out that these environmental concentrations can really vary a lot from, uh, from location uh, to location. Um, and in addition to this, I mentioned that um, there, the, the, the data suggests that the metabolic activity um, was the most sensitive of the endpoints. In a preparatory um, paper from 2013, one of the papers that preceded the, the official OECD 249, uh, the authors actually reported that in general, this was the assay that tended to be the most uh, sensitive in article W1. And they also pointed that um, these differences in assay sensitivity tended to be associated with the chemicals mode of action. In this case, um, the mode of action of these chemicals or of the seven tested chemicals is not really clear. So we couldn't really take any further conclusions, but uh, we could still see that the, the same trend was uh, was being followed with uh, the metabolic activity uh, showing to be the, the most uh, sensitive uh, in general. Uh, so we would go from fish to, to humans and uh, once again, uh, starting with the chemical warfare agents and related chemicals. In this case, um, as, as you know, we tested two cell lines and also two different time points. So uh, in this slide, you can see on the, the left um, the data for the CACO2, so the intestinal uh, epithelia cell line. The chemical is the, once again the one for Diffian. You have on top the data after 24 hours of exposure and uh, below after 48 hours of exposure. And then just by the side of it, we have the data for MG2, so the liver um, cell line, once again, 24 and um, 48 hours. The intention uh, was, uh, again, to estimate EC10 and EC50 values. And once again, for these chemicals, um, you can see that there's uh, quite low um, cytotoxic cytotoxicity. Um, uh, so we couldn't really reach the the zero point the, the EC50 uh, value um, for for none of the tested uh, of of the three uh, chemicals. We did see, however, some differences in the in the toxic potential uh, or the toxic response after 24 hours and 48 hours, and these tend to be contradictory between cell lines. So for CACO2, we see that uh, the effects are much lower. Uh, after 24 hours than they are after 48 hours. And then we have the opposite happening for FG2, so the liver cells. Uh, after 48 hours, we have the data for the neutral red uh, going below the EC50, while uh, after 48, none of it goes below this, uh, this percentage uh, mark. Um, so showing us that different uh, cell lines 
used as a proxy for different um, organs also present different responses to, to the same chemical, um, which was interesting to, to observe and the, the reason why we, we decided to add an additional time point uh, as well. In addition to that, we also saw, and reinforcing what I just mentioned, uh, we also saw that 1,4-Dithian uh, is approximately two times more toxic to the liver cells uh, than to the intestinal um, cells. Similarly, uh, we, we have the, here the plots for the explosives and related chemicals. We have, once again, CACO2 on the left, MG2 on the right, 24 hours on top, 48 hours uh, below. And here, um, it gets uh, even more interesting, of course, in, in my opinion. So, overall, we could see that uh, the explosives and related chemicals, uh, once again, tend to be more um, toxic than the chemical warfare agents and, and related chemicals. Uh, and the interesting part is specifically for CACO2, where we see a very clear distinction between the neutral red uh, data, the LMR blue, and the SFDA AM. So, very clear distinction in sensitivities of the different uh, assays. That, and this can be important not only for us at this point to, to try to hypothesize on uh, the mode of action of, of this chemical, in this case, uh, TNT um, to, uh, to intestinal uh, cells, but it may also shed some light on potential uh, future research and different assays for us, um, for us to, to target uh, in the future uh, as well. So, you can see that this differentiation happens for CACO2, but it doesn't really happen for FG2, once again showing different interactions uh, with the same chemical depending on the cell line. Um, and we could see that uh, when it comes to the FG2 cell line, so the liver cell line, only TNT and tetril uh, severely affected these cells. So, picric acid and 1,3-DNB uh, didn't really uh, show or uh, prove to be very cytotoxic. So overall, um, this data, um, the generated data, provided us some, with, with some important uh, information on and the toxicity thresholds of uh, these seven chemicals for these two cell lines, and also some insights on the potential uh, mechanisms of toxicity um, involved. Um, and based on this, uh, uh, specifically based on, on, the, on the potential mechanisms of toxicity and trying to look into uh, uh, the, the modes of action. We also um, try to compare these results with what is known in the literature. Uh, and we, we, we could see that TNT is known to cause uh, abnormal liver functioning, which actually aligns um, with uh, the description of uh, the adverse outcome pathway 220 or 220. That uh, that describes the 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 the, approach, the cascade of events leading to liver cancer, uh, being one of the key events uh, the the hepatotoxicity. Um, so it was also interesting for us to see that we we could align the in vitro uh, results with the in vivo uh, with what is observed in vivo uh, as well. Uh, in addition to that. Um, we also saw that there is an increased risk of colon and um, colon and, and rectum cancer uh, in the the population of the island of Vix. Uh, this is a, an island in Puerto in Puerto Rico um, that served as a, a military uh, camp uh, for the U.S. for I believe over 60 uh, 60 years. And in this case, while there was no specific AOP. Uh, linking um, what we observed uh, in, in these uh, assays to uh, colon, colon or, or uh, rectum uh, cancer, we could still identify three uh, molecular initiating events that, uh, once again, can be, uh, can be used for, for further uh, research uh, as well. In addition to that, of course, um, these, these assays uh, focus on, on acute uh, effects. Uh, to to both um, to both organs to both liver and uh, and intestinal epithelia. However, as uh, as seafood consumers, we are potentially uh, exposed chronically, and this is something that should be taken into consideration as well in in further uh, research. So 
overall uh, when it comes to the data gathered for fish uh, due to the, pot the, the possibility of having a one-on-one -on -one extrapolation from in vitro to in vivo, this data can be used in risk assessment and uh, in full compliance with the three R's. Uh, I here refer to three R's, but uh, I think that there are constantly uh, R's being added to this. So by now it's uh, more than, than three uh, for sure. Um, when it comes to the, the risks to human health, uh, even though uh, we could um, estimate some uh, toxicity thresholds, this is still not enough for us to confidently uh, estimate uh, risk. And so further research uh, on this is necessary. Um, however, um, given the, the increased human pressure in the marine uh, ecosystems and uh, overlapping with the locations uh, where dump sites are are uh, are placed, uh, I believe that uh, an act, a more active management of these munition dump sites um, is required and will happen. And we'll have more uh, more uh, studies addressing this this issue. And I, I also think that it will uh, heavily rely on in vitro uh, data and in silico data uh, as well. So that brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, I'm happy, of course, to answer or try to answer at least any questions you may have. Um, in the meantime, you also have my email uh, here. So if you have any other question uh, afterwards, feel free to just contact. I'm, I'm happy to try to help if I can. Thank you for the presentation. Um, now we can move on to the question, and I already saw there are several questions in the chat. Um, so the first question um, is why was it decided to dispose of the ammunition of the sea as opposed to other methods of disposal storage? Um, mainly because it was cheaper and back then it was thought that it wouldn't cause an issue. Uh, so the storing and maintenance of uh, of this munition would be much more expensive than just throwing it in the ocean. And then by then the idea was that um, no one would ever touch it again. Um, and it would be underwater many times uh, buried in sand. Uh, and so out of sight, out of mind, I guess, uh, they, they thought there wouldn't be uh, an issue with that uh, at all. So yeah. That that's really the, the main the main reason, just being easier and cheaper. Okay. Um, the second question is: with the current knowledge, what would have been the best way of disposing of said ammunition? Um. So instead of instead of uh, the dumping in the ocean, um, ideally, ideally, this would have been uh, stored and gradually destroyed. Um, but yeah, uh, it's a bit too late for that now for all these, uh, thousands of, of tons that we can find, uh, both here over the Belgian coast in the Baltic sea and, and all over. Um, so yeah, I, ideally that would be, a, a um, a gradual disposal, um, and, and destruction, um, and that would be the safest and, and the yeah. best way of, of disposing of, of this munition. Okay. Um, the following question was, uh, what, what were species most affected and how did this impact the, in the ecosystem? If there is such information. Yeah. Um, so we covered in this different, uh, different, um, organisms. We tested, uh, marine microalgae. We tested the, the copepod species, Nitocras pinipes, so a benthic, uh, species. Uh, we tested fish and uh, human cells, and in general, we saw that the copper pods tend to be quite sensitive, um, which is also quite interesting because this is a, a very relevant uh, species um, for for us. So it's a benthic species in direct contact with the soil in which uh, potential ammunition uh, is is present, and it's also a primary consumer, meaning that uh, if there is a full disruption of these populations. It might well uh, lead to uh, to uh, problems within the whole uh, food uh, food web. Uh, of course, in terms of actual um, 
issues in the environment, this has to be done or assessed in a in a case to case uh, scenario, depending on the concentrations there on the specific uh, conditions of of that dumping location. So it's a bit tricky to generalize uh, on that. All right. Um, the next question, um, how are concentrations of chemical impacted by the streams and do they spread far away or is it local? Um, that depends as well on uh, on the dump site, uh, on the conditions of uh, of uh, how on how the the the, the munition were dumped. Um, in general, we see that there is quite a fast uh, dilution of these chemicals in the water column, as is expected due to all the currents. Um, but the initial concentrations also vary a lot. If the munition is fully buried in sediment, for instance, the concentrations in the water column right uh, on the bottom layer are much lower than if this munition is fully uh, in the open, uh, right? Um, so, in general, the concentrations can vary easily from a few nanograms to worst case scenario. Um, and this was detected in, in Hawaii, I believe, um, at some point, 82 uh, milligrams per liter of TNT were detected uh, close to a, a huge bomb uh, dropped there. Um, so, the concentration range hugely, uh, but the dilution tends to be quite, quite rapid. All right, thank you. Um, then the following question, how did you get the mole molecular initiating event? Uh, did you do some gene expression analysis? No, uh, so the, the identification of the molecular initiating events uh, was uh, once again based on a, a UP uh, wiki. Uh, so trying to identify uh, um, initiating events that could be associated with potential uh, cancer uh, or uh, cancer as an adverse outcome pathway. So the idea here was to try to identify these events uh, so that we would also know what kind of cascade of events would, uh, would follow. Uh, and uh, based on that, uh, also identify future uh, potential assays. Being, yeah, and gene expression would be a nice one as well, to be honest. <laughs> Okay. Um, and are you doing the measurements of the chemicals in the different area? If so, are you doing it on a regular basis? And does the level evolve with time? And if so, how increasement or decreasement? Um, yeah, so within uh, this project, uh, two of the partners are um, from the, the Belgian military, and they are responsible uh, for doing the monitoring, the chemical monitoring of uh, of the dump site. Uh, and over the years, we've been we yeah this this has been monitored, and it's been quite it's been relatively uh, stable. Uh, I to be honest, I can't really provide much details on this because uh, this information uh, has to stay within the project. But uh, it's yeah, the, the monitoring is done uh, on a, on a yearly basis. Um, it's it's been done and for several years already. Okay. Um, yeah. Then I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, so I think it's time now to end the webinar. Uh, thank you to the participants for attending the the session, and thank you, Jao, for your nice presentation. Um, the recording of this webinar will be posted uh, in the coming weeks on the Replace YouTube channel. Uh, I would like to remind you, if you want a certificate of attendance, please put your email address um, and name in the chat. I will try to provide uh, to provide the certificate in the coming weeks. Um, also, if you would like to register for our next um, webinar, it has been already released, so I will put the register link in the chat for those who are interested. Um, and uh, during this webinar, we will welcome two speakers from the UCL, uh, and they will present their work on um, 3D models to study tumor developments and um, alcohol use disorder. 
And finally, if you have any feedback on the webinars or any question or remarks, or even if you would like to present your work um, on alternative methods uh, during this uh, during a following session, you can indicate it uh, in a survey when you close this webinar, it will be directly available. So thank you again. And um, yeah, I hope to see you during the next, the next session. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye.